Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So what changed in your life after the message last week? Was there any rethinking, reshuffling that took place over this past week? And did you expect me to ask that? <laughs> How has your trust been changing? As you lean more on Jesus and less on the things in your life, how have you, or your prayers changed this last week? As you think of more about the giver and less about the gifts, has anything changed? Or are you still the same? You have to remember last week we talked about a rich man who sought salvation as if it was like any other riches in his life that he inherited. He wanted to add salvation to his list of wealth and prestige that set him above the rest. When confronted by Jesus, he left sad because he knew that the things he had acquired in life mattered more to him than Jesus. Now, I don't know if it was all of his riches or just a few particular heirlooms that he was hung up on, but something in his life was more precious to him than Jesus. So he left his heart, he left sorrow had hung low with his life as he had built it fully intact. And if that encounter shook you at all, then good. If it made you think about anything, then wonderful. And if not, you've got another chance to speak. And today's gospel reading is a continuation of that event. Today's reading is the aftermath of that conversation and the devastation left in its wake. Jesus told this man to sell all that he had and give it to the poor. And like a bomb going off, it impacted all standing within a reasonable radius of Jesus. The man in response left with his heart poked at but not penetrated. And as he walks away, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth. Now, like I said last week, you don't have to be rich to be this rich man. How difficult it will be for any one of us to enter the kingdom of God so long as we have a firm grip on anything other than Jesus. And when I thought about this reading a while back, I thought about the obvious conversation about how we use our wealth, how we treasure it, how we spend our resources for others, or how we hoard them for ourselves. Jesus clearly tells us that the things we cling to cannot save us. Can't bring them with us either. You know, there's another truth in this encounter in the follow. It's more than just about putting a camel to the eye of the needle. It's more than just about wealth and treasure. This is about salvation. This is about salvation and eternity and how it is all accomplished. This is about the attempts that we made to weasel our way into heaven without confronting the horrors and beauty. another test of the heart. This is another call to align ourselves with Jesus and renegotiate our alliances. It isn't just about earthly comforts and accomplishments. This sermon today isn't an indictment on the 1% or those who have a comfortable retirement on the horizon. This is about eternity. How we get there versus how we think we get there. Yes, wealth is distracts. But Jesus is much more focused on the kingdom God and the human impossibility of salvation. Now, you know, I've been married for, gosh, eight years now, and I'm still learning a lot of things. I don't want you to laugh at me for my ignorance, although you probably will. But I've found that if I agree with my wife and acknowledge when I've been a knucklehead, life runs a lot smoother. If I were to support her in her vocation as a mother, if I take care of my laundry and do the dishes each morning, then we just get along better. It's not that she loves me more when I do those things, it just alleviates the stress that comes with clutter and disagreement. Plus, you know this with any relationship, that the more time and effort you invest in someone, the more grace they're willing to extend back to you. Do her a favor by putting in the time, showing your commitment and love. This works well in dealing with people. This is actually how we build up our relationships. 
That's how we win friends and influence people. But do we carry over that same principle with God? Do we think that what we do for God or in his name influences his love for us or his willingness to grant us salvation? Do our works or lack thereof have the power to push God away or even draw him nearer? Now based on last week's message, each of us knows that we have things that get in the way of our relationship with Jesus. And these are good things. They're blessings from God that we've allowed to replace him. And so each of us knows that we can be in the shoes of that rich man. And Jesus looks at the rich man walking away. He looks at his disciples. He looks at us and he says plainly that it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than it is for, to get any one of you who trust in riches more than me into heaven. But I think this powerful statement offends more than just the rich man. To be honest, if I were a disciple hearing those things, I'd be pretty ticked off hearing this. You mean to tell me that I left my family and my job and my sense of security, my whole life behind to follow you, and that isn't enough to sacri of a sacrifice to earn my way into heaven? I haven't done enough. It's physically impossible for a camel to an eye of a needle. We all know that. So if that's the case, then all of us are in trouble when it comes to eternity. As recorded in Mark, the disciples actually responded in desperation. Well, then who can get in? We thought that those riches were a sign of God's favor, but clearly they've just become an obstacle. If the wealthiest, most privileged, and properly behaved among us can't get in, then Now, maybe you can identify with that desperation. Maybe you have a list of accomplishments in your head that you're counting on when it's your time to go. I'm here every Sunday ushering, helping distribute communion, teaching Sunday school, playing the music. I pay my tithes. I show up and worship weekly. I fill 500 little cups of cheese for German today. I've done my time. I've put in my hours. God knows I've worked hard in this place for him and his kingdom. What do you mean it's impossible for me to enter the kingdom? Just look at what I've done. Look at how I've sacrificed. Look at how I've given up things in my life to follow Jesus. I'm doing all that I can. And Jesus still says it's easier for a camel to fit through a needle than it is for me to get to heaven. Look, I get it too. I'm a pastor. I went through eight years of schooling with all the debt that comes with it. I've committed my life to his service, feeding his sheep, and he speaks the same words to me. If it's hard for his disciples, it's certainly hard for me. Not just hard, but impossible. So what's the point? What is Jesus really getting at? Much, about much more than just wealth. He's speaking about more than just clinging too tightly to the things of this world. It isn't just about loosening your grip on the riches of this world. It's about loosening your grip on your sense of entitlement. It's about loosening your grip on the deeds that you think have earned you heaven. I'm sorry to break it to you. All the time that we put in here, all the knowledge we spent, fed and bodies warmed in our building, all of those things haven't brought you any closer to heaven. None of those things have ushered you to the front of the line at St. Peter's pearly gates. And in fact, Jesus warns us that these things, just like riches, can actually distract us from the kingdom of God. They can draw our eyes away from Jesus onto ourselves, our strengths, and our accomplishments. You know you can't take riches with you, and you certainly can't cash in your labor for the Lord and exchange it for eternal salvation. Now this matters a lot. This point, no matter how fine it is, is important to make. You are involved in 0% of your salvation. 
It isn't a 50-50 deal with God. It isn't 80-20. It isn't even 99% God and 1% you. If you find yourself clinging to the works that you have accomplished, no matter how selflessly they have been done, you're denying the word of Christ. The minute you claim ownership over any percentage of your salvation, you are diminishing the work of Jesus on the cross. He did 100% of the work. He endured 100% of the punishment. He died 100% of the death. He accomplished all of it without your help. Thank you very much. He can handle it all, and he did. He didn't need your works or approval or time cards that you punched in your mind as you volunteered at church. He did it all, as Luther says, without any merit or worthiness in you. So don't take credit for what God has done. Camel will walk through the eye of a needle before you can claim any glory on your own. Let go of the firm grip you have on the spiritual resume that you have typed out. Rip off those badges of honor that you wear. Shed the cloaks of self-righteousness that you've stitched for yourself. And fall face down at the foot of the cross. In humility, recognize you have received everything from Jesus at that cross, even though you deserve nothing. You've been given the riches of heaven and Jesus' work on that cross despite your best efforts. Has bothered the disciples since they had left quite a bit to follow Jesus, and it bothers us, if we're honest, in our self made uh, world that we have. If it's impossible for us to be saved on our terms, then salvation rests in God's hands alone. This reality undercuts any possibility of presumption, arrogance, autonomy, or self-congratulations, all of which come quite naturally for us. Jesus' teaching here is, is really humbling. And not because he tells us to humble ourselves. Rather, humility is the inevitable response of those who have heard and believed the good news that God owes us nothing. And yet gives us everything. Our message today is fairly basic. God alone graciously saves. And we, in response, do what the rich man didn't do. We humble ourselves and follow him. And as we do so, we let go of the things that hinder and cling firmly to Jesus. Now, you might be getting a little bit angry. You might be saying to yourself, well, if God doesn't tally up my work, then I'm going to start scaling it back. What's the point of exhausting myself if it doesn't earn brownie points with God? Well, here's a truth that's hard to accept. God is as near to you in your sins as he is in your spiritual time. He's with you in the valleys just as much as he is with you on the mountaintops. The reason we carry out our Christian faith is not to pull God closer to us. We know our works haven't brought us any closer to heaven. But those works have brought heaven closer to our neighbors. When we deny ourselves a new kingdom work, we're bringing that gospel to other people. When we introduce the kingdom to those who are outside of it, then maybe, just maybe, we begin to grow that kingdom. These works that we've claimed for our own are actually done to bring Jesus to others, not to bring us closer to Jesus. It is impossible for us to enter that kingdom without Jesus' work, so what about those who don't even know Jesus? It's impossible for them too. You need Jesus, they need Jesus, so show them Jesus as you follow Jesus. So yes, you can't take treasures here on earth with you into eternity, but I think even more so, we can't carry those deeds and good works with us either. There's nothing we can exchange for salvation outside of the flesh and blood of Jesus. In humility and helplessness, we point to a crucified and risen Savior as the only payment that is sufficient for all of our sin and selfishness. And the moment we cling to anything outside of Jesus for work or safety, security, or salvation, we make it impossible to enter the kingdom of God. 
those things that were good, that were good things given from God can actually become millstones around our necks that drag us straight to hell. We can only admit our unworthiness and cling to the cross. We can only confess our despicable and sinful nature and put on the robe of righteousness that Christ did. It's just as the old hymn says, not the labors of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite go? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply through thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, homeless look to thee for grace. Foul I to you, the fountain fly, wash me, save you, or I will die. Let that message resonate and ricochet around in your head. Let it burrow itself deep in your heart. Let go of the things you cling to so tightly. Not just people and things, but the credentials that you feel make you so righteous. Drench yourself with the blood of Jesus. Let it cover every inch of you so that you may be made holy. And in turn, use those efforts of the kingdom of God to bring heaven to your knees. Let them see the impossibility of salvation solved only in the risen body of Jesus. Your salvation, my salvation, the restoration of all creation, it all hinges on his work. Not anything you or I can muster. Thank God for that. Trust in that and cling to that only. Would you please pray with me? Praise something, Bob, we can put on quite a show. We are reminded today how helpless we are. As we continue to wrestle with Jesus' words, help us to shed the cloaks of righteousness that we so proudly wear. Help us to admit we are just naked beggars needing clothing and protection. Nothing in our hands we bring simply to your cross we cling. May that be our daily morning prayer. As we live that as we live that out, depending solely on you, may others see the necessity of Jesus. By your power, by your spirit, empower us to live as ambassadors to your kingdom, bringing heaven to those who have fallen from grace. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me. Thank you.